Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second part of the Wakilisha Dak or Wild Children's Day um, series. We're very happy to have you join us. Um, this episode and this podcast is brought to you by Wakilisha, which is a non not for profit, non governmental organization that works to advocate for justice and education for children in conflict with the law. My name is Brian Bright. And I am one of the co-hosts of this podcast, and I am joined by my lovely co-hosts, who I will allow to introduce themselves at this point. Yes. Uh, my name is Zipara Njuguna. I'm the Productions Manager at Wakilisha. Hi, everyone. Sorry. My name is Elizabeth Jambi. I am the founder and CEO of Wakilisha Initiative and co-host of this podcast. Great. Yeah. Very happy to have you both Um join us today before we get into the content and you know all the serious things um just to introduce this um episode because we're talking about children and digitized um legal systems i would like to know if you can share with all of us what was your first phone or do you remember your first time accessing the internet or what is your most embarrassing moment on the internet? If you can answer all three, great. If you can just answer one or two, that's also good. Me? Yeah. Why do I have I'm to start always? <laughs> <laughs> I like how ZP always asks me. Like me. Is it my turn? Like, I'm yes. looking at you. <laughs> I definitely not answering the embarrassing part. I'll give you guys too much power. <laughs> um, Accessing a phone, I was in form one, yes, and the internet. It quite uh, there were those Nokia, the one with buttons. I can't recall what what it was called. Mm -hmm. And then you had to go to Opera BB, and <laughs> it was so hectic, honestly. Yes, and it was that time for Facebook, and Facebook was such a big deal back then. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So, guess that's yes okay yeah oh me. me yeah you <laughs> <laughs> it's now your turn <laughs> um you would have to bring like a thousand police officers for me to share my most embarrassing moment so i will not share that <laughs> but i feel you do like share oh wow <laughs> no, <like> me. <laughs> uh, okay, so i mean with see. you because you're my friend oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not no the sense. whole world. <laughs> uh, yeah, not the whole world. Um, my first time, I can't actually remember my 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 first phone or my first um actual time. But we also use those phones, like the small Nokia that had like the OK button was yeah. in the middle, mm -hmm. and if you wanted to use the internet, you had to like type. It was A B C D. Yeah. Like by the time you're done typing the the website wow. you're visiting, I don't like. We actually had so much patience, oh, yeah, honestly. Um, uh, what was I using the internet for most of the time? I think music. Uh, Wap trick. Wap trick. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was afraid of saying it because was it even legal? All the, all the, all the Gen Z are not gonna know what. Yeah. Wap they don't is. know what you're talking about. Um, and Facebook, like, oh my, how are we even seeing those tiny Facebook? Like, on the like, screen was so tiny. <laughs> oh my gosh. No one's yeah. gonna get it. Now yeah. we've evolved so much. Uh, from then to where we are, but I think that's my first memory of digitized systems yeah. yeah wow first of all i'm surprised that your first phones had opera mini <laughs> because okay my first it was my mom's that. phone let me clarify <laughs> <laughs> my first phone i remember my first phone it was a blue nokia 1110i oh. it did not have internet obviously and this is like i remember getting it in december of 2006 oh i was just done with class six going to class seven and uh, yeah i didn't have internet but then all i needed it for was to text um you know my friends and call and i don't remember what else i used it for maybe play the snake game oh <laughs> i was addicted to that game is it the nokia that had like the gray like almost like a collar gray no that, that that's one? the 33 okay. oh that's a 33 yes. yeah 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 so that it wasn't it until i think class eight that's when i got my first phone with the internet and i don't even think i used the internet on that phone because i didn't get facebook until form one 
Mm. Yeah. So I'm not sure what I used the phone for. But yeah, of course, as soon as I got on Facebook, then that's all I did on the internet. And, you know, WAP trick, of course, and downloading music. And <laughs> yeah, but that's my first memory. Of course, I'm also not going to share my most embarrassing um, <laughs> <laughs> moment for the world to hear. But um, yeah, it's great to know like what access we had to like digital tools as children because that formed the backbone of the conversation that we had um, yeah. with this panel children in the digitized legal systems what this means for children in digitized courts what does it mean for children living in a very digitized society right, right? with computers and social media and parents who are always posting them there's lots of conversation around this um around ai mm. in yes. children and digitized systems that comes up in this um panel so um please listen in to our very amazing panelists and all they had to say um good morning everyone um it's very nice to be here and um thank you for your patience and for being here today um and it's my humble duty to introduce them. The second panel um, will be talking about children in the in di and digitized legal systems. Um, my name is Brian Bright. I am the co-director of communications at Wakilisha. And I am joined by this um, wonderful panel who will um, help us have this conversation together. And um, I will ask them to introduce themselves, um, starting with um, the first person on my immediate left. Good morning. My name is Valentine Manyasi. I'm a prosecution counsel from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. I prosecute within the Children Division, uh, which is part of the ODPP. Uh, and I, on a daily basis, deal with uh, children in contact and conflict to the law. And it's a, it's a subject I'm passionate about. And we are always looking for ways to improve children's experiences in the judicial system. Thank you. Thank you, Valentine. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nelson Nkari. I am an advocate and a software engineer and also the founder and CEO of Legal Tech Kenya, or in full Legal Technologies Kenya Limited. Uh, we innovate in the justice space, um, especially dealing a lot with automation and AI systems for use uh, in legal work. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson, and welcome. Thank you. I'm all protocols observed. My name is Joy Modoni Gitao. I'm the legal co-legal director at Wakilisha. And um, what we do is that we do three things for children who are in um, conflict with the law, contact with the law, in need of care and protection. Number one, we provide legal advice and, and uh, representation and support for them. Uh, so we get pro bono lawyers who, can, who are able to uh, take up cases with us. Number two, we offer them mentorship. Uh, and number three, we advocate for their rights through various uh, methods. So that's what we do at Wakilisha, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Okay. Good morning, once again. My name is Jackie Kibosia. I'm a magistrate based at uh, Milimani Children's Court and specialize in children matters, and especially I have a very keen interest uh, in... Uh, the digital space for children, because it's an area that has not been explored. So I'm also here to learn and learn and relearn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to all panelists, and um, welcome to this conversation. And now um, to my panel, we're talking about children and digitized legal systems. But then I imagine that there could be people in here who are not even sure what we're talking about when we say digitized legal systems. Um, maybe some of us already know that legal systems were digitized at some point, maybe because of COVID and the need to do that. Um, but how exactly were they digitized? What digital systems are we talking about? And I can address this question to Honorable Kibosia. Um, now, COVID for us came as a blessing in disguise. Um, on 15th of March, 2020, we closed all the physical hearings for, for health reasons, for safety. Now, after, I think, that Monday morning, we gathered as magistrates and asked, what about our clients? In as much as we are closing, we will be working from home. 
how will our clients access justice? If, for instance, a child is uh, defiled on Monday morning, where will they go to? That question disturbed us, and for some strange reason, we refused to go home. We decided to have a meeting, as a, by then I was in Makadara Law Courts, and we asked, a very, um, we asked ourselves questions. What about those in, in, in prison, for instance? Do, 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 they, do we need to reach out to them? What, what does Article 50 mean during this uh, pandemic? So we had a meeting, an emergency meeting, and came up with what we called COVID rules, COVID practice directions that were adopted by the NCAJ as official rules that uh, originated from Makadara Law Courts because we refused to close the court. We got into our cars then, we realized no, we cannot just leave uh, our clients. So we had to go back and had an emergency meeting. The first virtual court was launched on 16th of March in Makadara Law Courts, in a criminal setup. And what we did was to reach out to our clients in custody, just to check on them, because they, they had panicked, they, 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 they thought the world had come to an end. In fact, this one I spoke to, the first, my court was the first to go virtual, and they asked, are you still alive? And I told them, I thought you were seeing me. They said, no, you could be there, but you, you are dead spiritually. And uh, ours was to assure them that, that we are still there and we, we, we now ask them to try and as much as possible to communicate with their loved ones through our platforms. Mm -hmm. So yes, the first digital court was not a court session, but it was a meet and greet, and also to connect the clients in custody with, with, uh, with their loved ones who came to court to just find out if if they were fine, and they could also see them digitally. So that is how the remoteness of the, the virtual court began. Mm -hmm. And then of course the civil space, the advocates complained and said, no, we cannot just sit at home. Um, and the first was to have a meeting with the then uh, Chief Justice, um, Emeritus. And uh, the virtual, the civil space was, was opened up now officially after the 16th of March, we came up with draft uh, practice directions. And since then, we've never gone back. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm sitting, I was just sitting next to one of the advocates, and we are almost proceeding with her here. <laughs> then we remembered you're supposed to go virtual. <laughs> so we could not proceed. So we decided we will proceed virtually on Tuesday. So it's, it's easier now because we are able to reach far and wide. I can report that Makadara reached 2,800 within six months. Those are just clients we reached out, both children and uh, adults. And we're able to reach combined, I'll give you the stats for the children, but to just reach out, we reached out to all the CCIs. Mm -hmm. All um, children homes were reached. Within one week, we had done over 120 children, just checking on them. And I'm glad that uh, Maggie is here because we first, we did um, teletherapy. The therapist was online just to talk to the children in that space. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's the, the, the genesis of the virtual space. It started from a very small court in Makadara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Milimani, the bug <laughs> caught up in Milimani. And uh, so far we've made a lot of gains but we are still um, waiting for practice directions for children. How do I treat a child in the virtual space? Uh -huh. How do I protect their privacy? Yeah. I impressive. Um, I mean, we have to appreciate the journey um, that has been and also acknowledging that what needs to be done or is yet to be done. And my next question would be, I imagine that having to work in that digital space, um, you would need some sort of digital literacy of you know of some sorts and i know this was even a question that was asked already people in informal settlements people from rural in rural backgrounds how are they impacted by not in not being very digital literate, literate to access virtual court or um, e-filing and such systems that are already in place and i know that um, some of us have worked 
with these um, children in the past, and maybe I'll give Joy um, an opportunity to respond to this. How does literacy impact children accessing these systems? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bright. Um, let me start from uh, just explaining um, about digital literacy is very important. If you need um, these children or any court user generally to use the digital, the digitized court system, case management um, system, e-filing platforms. And um, why do I say this? Let me start from explaining the concept of access to justice. When you talk about access to justice, it, it, it actually means, of course, it's the physical, just the, um, the literal, in the literal sense, being able to access um, these justice platforms. It means um, being informed of what is happening. It's actually a right of every, um, if you look at the justice system, it has the litigants. And in this case, we're looking at maybe even the children. We are looking at, and when you look at the children, you're also looking at their parents or their guardians who are supposed to support them throughout the justice system. You're looking at the officers, like every, every single person in the justice system. And um, as Honorable um, Kibosia has talked about, when, when COVID started and um, people went digital, especially the judiciary, there were a lot of things that the judiciary did towards, um, by the help of stakeholders, trying to improve digital literacy. For example, the Law Society of Kenya was very active in doing a lot of um, awareness on how to use the e-filing platform, how to use um, the, the virtual platforms, and, and I think the practice directions did help. But I think there's still a lot to be done in as far as now uh, children, and I hope once the practice directions come out, those are some of the things that we'll do is improve the digital literacy especially for children. I think the first panel really alluded to um, how uh, knowledgeable or how digital literacy is spread out in Africa and in Kenya. We still have very low penetration, and that tells you that if that is not addressed, then the concept of access to justice will just be something that's in the air. It will just be an idea, but it won't be something that is actualized. So digital literacy is very, very important in as far as informing them how to use the platforms, why they are using the platforms, what are the ways they can use the platforms, what do they need to say, especially when it comes to children, these are a special group of, of, of people in our society, and there are certain rights of theirs that must be protected to an, ex an extent to secure their best interest. For example, privacy. So how do you maintain the privacy? You know, how do you access the platform and maintain your privacy? Is the e-filing platform also child-friendly? Maybe we can have like a child-friendly uh, interface where the child can actually go and access. I mean, this is my wild dream. They can go and access and just find that, wow, okay, I can click here, know when my next court date is, know what the court said last time, be able to, you know, and also have the advocates, the prosecutors, everyone in that chain and even the officers where they are, maybe if they're in remand, their parents know how to use this. So, yeah, I think that's what, would, what I'd have to say in as far as digital literacy and access to justice is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that response. And I'm also very curious to know that um, the, the exact situation with the people, with the children that we work with, um, maybe any statistics that you can share on how a certain student from, say, um, a rural background or from an informal settlement in Nairobi needed to get to court, but then, you know, they went all the way and they were told the court is virtual and they don't have a computer or they don't have legal representation. Um, what is the situation for that child? Um, does the court give any grace, you know, to children in that situation? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact statistics, but what I can say to that is that there's a real challenge there that's presented. Um, when you talk about access to even the digital um, skills and the literacy, of course, there's a segment of children who may not have that privilege, mm -hmm. you know, um, from um, low-income homes and, you know, informal settlements. And unfortunately, you find that they're the ones who are mostly um, victims of this 
Um, they are probably the ones who are in contact with the law. And so it becomes a real challenge because access to even internet in those places is a real challenge. So does the court extend grace? I think that's something that is a very, um, it really depends on who you're before, I could say that. But in terms of, as a matter of principle, it should be. I think for children, there's a softer landing. Mm -hmm. um, and for, a child, uh, for a children matter, ideally, they should be supported by the help of an advocate who is able to inform them about that process. But of course, for a child who's not represented, there's a lot of things that may slip through the cracks. But uh, I know the judicial officers um, are really keen on, I mean, there's a lot of grace in as far as um, maybe coming to court and finding all oh, the court was virtual. But if they, I think currently, the court is actually still, until the practice rules are done, the court is encouraging the children to still come in person. And I'm really happy about the Children Act, the 2021 Act, which has actually really emphasized on that privacy during court proceedings for children. And that if, you know, the children courts aspect, so even the people in that court are very well trained or should be trained on aspects to do with um, how this child would come into the court, what they should be informed of, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's what I can say, unless uh, my fellow panelists have specific. How would you say, how child-friendly are these systems? Um, thank you for the question. I think um, where we are coming from as of now is from a place where we want to, um, first of all, establish uh, these systems and make sure they're in place mm -hmm. and make sure they're actually achieving uh, what we want them to achieve. Um, key to which is actually access to justice. And um, there are very many aspects of access to justice, as uh, Joy mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to go back first to digital mm -hmm. literacy mm -hmm. uh, because there's, there's three pillars of digital literacy. Um, there's your ability to find the information that you're right. looking for. So uh, assuming um, I have a matter uh, before court, but I am not able to find this information, that is one, as one pillar of digital literacy that I have already failed at, or that this system that we have put in place has already failed me at. And um, another consideration that we also have to put in place is um, cybersecurity for, for this accessibility of this or your ability to find these um, systems. Because um, sometimes you might find that uh, the systems have been compromised and whatever you are accessing is not actually what you're supposed to. You've been redirected to um, a malicious website and you are completely not aware mm -hmm. that you're actually in a completely different location from where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you're even giving out your own private information to these malicious people, and we don't know what they're going to do with this information, but we can always assume that it's not something positive. Um, the second pillar of this is uh, your ability to evaluate. So are we building these systems in such a way that um, when I find them, I am able to evaluate and say to myself that this is actually where I'm supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Or um, have we put in place enough security measures to make sure that even when someone tries to redirect me to somewhere that is not where I'm supposed to be, I can be able to tell that this is the right thing, this is, this is the wrong mm -hmm. thing. We have very many security uh, measures that we can put in place to ensure that uh, the people that we are targeting to use these systems are able to evaluate. And in this particular case, we, we've had the, um, from the child psychologist that um, the developmental capacity and the ability to be able to decipher um, this is wrong, this is right, perhaps might not be where uh, we want it to be. And so that's an, another consideration that we have to put in place, uh, even as we think about um, the evaluation capability of adults, then we also have to take into consideration the evaluation ca capabilities of children and build that into these systems and make sure that we are adding this extra layer of protection. Mm -hmm. Then finally, it's um, communication. So um, once you've found it, once you've evaluated it, are you able to communicate? Do you understand? So are we using language that um, allows them to interact with these systems? Is it difficult? Is it presented in a way that um, is not friendly to them? And beyond that, are we also building in accessibility measures for the differently abled mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, we are not also perpetuating another injustice yeah. through these systems? So uh, those are some very good uh, key considerations that then speak to access to justice. Mm -hmm. So. Um, my experience so far has been that uh, we are coming from a place where we are building these systems and trying to perfect them. 
So perhaps the considerations that we've, I have talked about and the considerations that my fellow panelists are going to talk about or have talked about might not have been um, key considerations when these systems are being put in place. Uh, for example, uh, when talking about virtual court attendance, um, I, I know when we, when, when we uh, are talking about physical court attendance, sometimes we take measures to protect mm -hmm. uh, the identity of the child. Right. So are we also going to translate that into um, the online platforms as well? What technologies are we going to put in place? And what considerations are we making for the uh, devices that these people are using to access these systems? Are they capable of running whatever applications that we're using to ensure the protection of these children? Mm -hmm. And um, we've had a lot of discussions as a country about how we have uh, good internet connectivity rates, but the numbers really do not speak to that. Um, the 2021 survey by the Communication Authority stated that there were more feature phones than smartphones in this country. Mm -hmm. So in, in as much as we are communicating that uh, we are really a developing nation and uh, we are putting in place measures, then we also have to consider um, the people who do not have access to the right devices. So even when we build out these systems to take all these considerations into place, then we, it's, it also becomes a social issue. What else, what more can we do? What extra steps can we take to make sure that, yes, we have built these systems, but they are also not becoming another barrier to access to justice? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I like that you already started to talk about um, privacy of some sort um, for children who are in this, um, who are in the in the legal system. And this brings me to my next question that I wanted to ask um, Honorable Kibosia. What protocols do we have to ensure data privacy? I mean, from the previous panel and from what we already know, the on this online space is not exactly you know, the safest space to be in. Um, how do we protect data of um, children who are in conflict with the law? Um, how do we ensure that while, even though we're moving to a digital space, that we still are not infringing on their rights to a fair trial? And lastly, and this is just to merge it with a question that we received here, how do we take care of criminal records? Because we know they're not expunged and there are children involved. Um, how do we take care of you know, their criminal record in, you know, on the online cloud or in whatever um, management, management systems we are using? How do we maintain that that data relating to these children is private? and is not accessed or accessible by, how do we protect it, in short? Now, uh, what we agreed with um, is uh, we looked at other jurisdictions. We did mm -hmm. a comparative study and realized that you cannot force parties to join online. They're supposed to request the court. Yeah. It, it's not forced. Um, during pre-trials, both civil and... Um, and um, criminal, especially criminal, we um, civil is easy because the checks and balances are not as many compared to a whole Article 50. Mm -hmm. The parties must request during pretrials. We want to do it virtually because then, if you force on the parties, the next thing the accused person will say, "I I didn't hear the court. The, it went off." I was forced onto the platform. That, again, we realized that would um, go against Article 50 on, on fair hearing and access to justice. So we allow parties to request that they want to go virtual or not. That is in the criminal space. Mm -hmm. In the civil space, I mean, majority of them, advocates prefer um, virtual unless one or two would say, I would like to come physically. And I think because they had missed the court, one of them told me, I have just missed being in that building. So, and of course, that's not a reason why you should come because we're encouraging you to go virtual. Right. So for the children, we have a general link. If you go right now to Milimani Locals Children's, um, the, the cause list, you'll find my link. Mm -hmm. So what I have done, that is my own innovation, is if when a child wants to talk to me virtually, like I talked to one in the UK, what we did is we created a link within a link. Mm -hmm. And I demanded that I get to see a 3D view of the room where the child was, mm -hmm. just to ensure that that child was there alone. alone. So we did 
we did a, a hybrid, we did a screen where I'm able to see the entire room so that there's no one else in that room. That was the first check. Because I realized we needed to interview the child. They needed to decide whether they were coming over for summer holidays or not. Sorry. So what we did is created a link within a link and ensure that I was the only one on this other side talking to the child and we were able to interview, but in an open space where there was no other person. And we, we, are able to, we were able to communicate. And then we have also told ICT not to uh, release any recordings of that child. So it is censored. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if I want that recording, then I must get to ICT to request for authorization for, for that specific uh, session with the child. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we do is we ensure that all children, especially if they're in conflict with the law, they do not turn on their cameras. Yes, and they don't talk to us in open court. They can listen to the advocate, they can listen to the court, but they can only access the listening part of it. If the child feels I need to talk to the court, then the person, especially YCTC, I'm glad they're here, they would do a, a message, a chat message, and say the child is okay to talk. Then, of course, then I will create another link within the link for just the prosecutor, the advocate, myself, and the child. Then we avoid the, the public getting to meet the child online. So that is what we do. And then also, um, the other issue is uh, that you say data, the, the information I, about the, the children. Yeah. We the, code, we code, like even in civil matters, we do not tell you the name of the child. Mm -hmm. We would put initials, we'll initialize all our proceedings. Mm -hmm. And also when we do the, the e-judgments mm -hmm. and, and, and read them out, we also try as much as possible not to mention the even the parties, we've gone to the extent of not mentioning the names of the parties. Because when I say Brian Bright, of course, if you have a custody case, everybody will know it must be Brian. So we'll say BB versus, you know, that is what we would do. So we've gone ahead to also protect the identity of the, of the parties, mm -hmm. not just the children, but also the parents. Because in that, the, the whole family is protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you. And. Um, while we're also still talking about online crimes, and um, the previous panel did speak to this a little bit. Oh, yes, yes, please. We, last week, we had a meeting to develop an app. Okay. Yes, so the good news is that there's going to be an app where children don't have to log in. Uh, if they want to talk to the court, they just need to, uh, to download the app. So we, we want to see how AI can help us to ensure that it's just that one child mm -hmm. by giving them an identifier mm -hmm. that, that only that child would have. So they will just have to download the app and then they're able to, to talk to the court. Okay. And then also for the civil space, I'm glad some of the advocates are here. We are also developing a co-parenting app where if parties don't want to talk to each other, <laughs> you can get the schedule for the whole year. If wow. it's parents' day, you get it online. <laughs> then you get to tick whether you are attending or not. Yes, yeah, so that information will be shared to the, to the, to the parents. So wow. yes, a co-parenting app is loading. And maybe we might need your expertise to see how we can make that work. So you can go to Apple Store and download our co-parenting app. Okay. And that was the innovation by yours truly. Wow. <laughs> well. Well, yeah, co congratulations to you and, and the team. And I will actually hold the question that I had initially so that we can talk about AI um, a little bit. Um, obviously, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and everyone's using it, you know, whether it's at school or at work, you know, to write your emails and um, to paraphrase things. Can we leverage AI in digital um, leg digitized legal systems, should we even dare do it? Um, you know, what are the pros and cons? And yeah, this is very much a Nelson question. <laughs> um, I think there's different ways of looking at the usability 
of AI? What, what are your intentions? What do you want to use it for? Um, as the Honorable Kibosi has mentioned, uh, they, there is one way they are trying to use AI in, in their system, but broadly, people are using artificial intelligence for information. Mm -hmm. I want to know something, or I want to put down this information in a particular manner. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most widely used case of uh, artificial intelligence yeah. at this moment in time. So um, when it comes to especially using it in, in legal procedures, mm -hmm. I, um, it's a very sensitive issue. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it also applies to other things like the medical field as well because of the potential consequences if AI gets it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so AI is built on data, on large data sets. So where are we getting this data from? Mm. Um, we recently uh, developed our own AI application and our source of information was primarily Kenya law. Mm -hmm. That was um, the database that we used to get access to hundreds of thousands of cases. And so, um, one of the things that we look for in artificial intelligence is to understand where did you get your information from? Is it a credible source? And um, if you are asked to open up um, your database, are you able to do that? Are you able to show us that truly whatever you say is the foundation of your artificial intelligence program is actually um, what you say it is? Or are you lying to us? Mm -hmm. Then um, another phenomena that we have is what we call uh, black box AI. Mm -hmm. It's where you're not able to explain how a decision has been arrived at by your artificial intelligence program. So it's most commonly happening in uh, deep learning systems. So it's whereby you just feed them data and they're able, based off of a few examples, the AI is able to learn and then uh, reproduce results. So when AI, when you're not able to tell us um, this is how the AI arrived at this decision, then it becomes a problem because we lose the verifiability of this decision. Because if I'm able to tell you this is the thought process of my AI, it, let's say it took this case, it also took this case, did a comparison and told you this is what you, you should expect, then th that data is verifiable because that, that's also the procedure I would go through as an advocate uh, when I'm going through my case law to try and write my submissions and all that. So essentially, it all comes back to data. Um, how accurate is this data? How well was it pre-processed? Were there any violations of privacy, especially now that we, talk, we are talking about uh, these very sensitive cases of children? And I'm happy to hear that um, the courts take a lot of um, they take a lot of measures to ensure that um, the identities of these people are very well protected. And so um, there's really a lot of considerations that go into place. But I would say it's a very good tool mm -hmm. if utilized, if built and use, utilized ethically. There are a lot of ethical considerations have, that have to go into place, and we as a society have to make a decision as to um, the rules that we need to put in place. We don't just have to leave it to government regulation because, or special interest groups, because with all these um, different kinds of interest groups, there will come different conflicting interests. So I think the approach that we need to take is to come up with a democratic process whereby we all get to decide um, what, what, how are we going to use this AI? Mm -hmm. Beyond the rules of the government that the government has put in place, what else are we going to use as a, as, as a society to say that this is what is right when using AI, mm -hmm. or this is what is wrong? Because if we leave it to tech companies like, like ourselves, we are going to take an approach for maximum profitability. Mm -hmm. That's what capitalism is all yeah. about. But when society says that these are the rules that we want to put in place, then we have no choice as a private uh, sector but to adhere to those rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the best approach um, to incorporate AI into the legal system. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I think we, can't, we can never um, conclusively talk about AI in one, in one sitting. And definitely um, is a conversation that I look forward to, to um, foster in the future, especially even with the Wakilisha podcast. And yeah, um, the last question that I had was um, on online crimes and especially crimes that involve children and involve the persons, rather the persons are committing these crimes are not just located in Kenya, you know, could be abroad and, you know, the child um, who's reporting this um, crime is in Kenya. How do we prosecute these, um, you know, these crimes? How do we deal with such um, cross-jurisdictional issues here? Valentine. 
so for the cross-jurisdictional issues, they're very common because now the, the world is a global village. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what happens is uh, we utilize mutual legal assistance and extradition in some of these cases. Uh, mutual legal assistance is uh, the cooperation between states or countries to ensure that there is exchange and sharing of information. Uh, you might need uh, assistance from maybe the UK, maybe the, 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 you, you found a victim in Kenya, right? And uh, you find a perpetrator in Kenya, I'm sorry. And the material they have is, it's for a victim who is based in the UK. So what can you do? You use mutual legal assistance to try and get information, to try and do investigations, to try and collect as much information as you can, uh, sharing of data between the two countries. And also, you know, mutual legal assistance is not just uh, the treaties. It's also based on the principle of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't have a treaty or anything like that, we have signed an agreement, uh, we can just agree that uh, I assist you, and in case this happens on my end as well, you can assist me. So mutual legal assistance is one of the avenues that is being utilized in cross-border crimes where the issues of jurisdiction come up. And actually, when utilized well, uh, prosecution is done and convictions are, are actually uh, reached. And the other, the other issue, I think, is extradition. Somebody can be extradited from one country to another to face charges in that country. So I think those, 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 those two are the main things that we use to prosecute when there's uh, trans, transnational crimes and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. And I think it's nice to hear that there is either solutions or things that are already being done um, to solve most of the problems that you know we're always talking about when it comes to children and contrary to the law. So um, we're very pressed for time, but um, I will give each one of you 45 seconds to give um, your parting shots when we're talking about children and digitized legal systems. What do we still need to do? And yeah, we can start with you, Valentine. I think what, what we need to do the most is ensure that the ch these children are protected in these spaces because uh, uh, most of the children who come to us already, they are children who have already been violated in one way or another. Uh, as uh, I was in a session where we were being informed as the criminal justice system, we cause secondary trauma to these victims because you find that uh, uh, a victim of a crime, maybe it's sexual in nature, which is very difficult to express. First reporting place is the parent, they have to narrate the whole story. And then they go to the investigator, they have to narrate the whole story. And then you come to the prosecution, I need to do pretrial to prep you, you narrate to me the whole story. You go to the magistrate, we narrate the whole story. You, you reach a point the child tells you, Apana, nimesha kuambia, you know. You are reopening them over and over again, and it's a wound that's not even healing, mm -hmm. you know. So we have to find ways of which the ODPP is trying within the limits of the law and the rights of everybody. We have a pilot project for pre-recorded evidence. We want to try and see, is there a way we can pre-record this evidence so that all these justice actors, we can get this story all at once. We don't need to cause secondary trauma to the victim over and over again. So we are very passionate in finding ways to really, really make the justice system better for these children. Because even as people work in the justice sector, we see them suffer. We, we, we want to improve their, their experience in the justice system. It does not matter how they got there. We just want to improve what, what the, the experience in the justice sector. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Valentine. Nelson? Yeah, I think um, it has to be about protecting the children. Um, one thing that we have, we have failed at in our online communities is creating safe spaces. Yeah. We know how much abuse um, happens in, in online spaces, especially on social media um, uh, or platforms like WhatsApp and the rest. So we have to make sure that we are not um, transferring the failures of the online communities that we have already created onto what is essentially supposed to be a safe space um, for these children who've perhaps already gone through some kind of abuse. So we really have to uh, make a conscious effort to ensure that um, the technology side ensures protection and even the rules that we put in place are very strict so that there, is no, there are no rooms or cracks 
for this abusive behavior to also permeate into these um, spaces that are essentially supposed to be safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joy? Um, thank you. So for me, my parting shot would be that let's not wait. Let's not wait for, um, I mean, the rules to be made. Let's innovate. I'm so happy to hear what Honorable Kibosia you're doing because that's innovative. You, you, you have a tool, which is the Children Act. You know what you need to do in as far as protecting their rights is concerned. So innovating and I'm so glad to see people in the tech space, also in the legal space, because we need you. Uh, for me, I have the idea of this platform. You have the technical know-how. You have the idea. Let's come together, collaborate, and make sure that these children's rights are protected. Um, and again, I'll repeat, the platform that I see is one that um, is accessible to all the players, one that is able to even detect how long has this matter been in court, you know, is it, is it on the red line that it's passing the, the, the time period? You know, where is this child? What is the age of this child? And this platform should also be accessible to the child and also the parents. So I really look forward to a time where we'll just all be bold enough, all stakeholders, the state, private sector, civil society, each and every person, people in the academia, to just come together and innovate, all for the best interest of the children that we're trying to uh, protect and safeguard. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, mine is uh, just to say that, yes, we've made a lot of progress as judiciary, but we still have a long way to go. I'm looking forward to a time when you're able to set your date online. Like the way you, you, you get your flight, you can change the date, you, can, you don't have to come to me with a diary. Like I have two diaries running parallel, and I have to literally give you a date. So you... I'm looking forward to a time when a child will tell me, I'm not ready to see you today. Then that child is able to just click somewhere and give me a date when they are ready. And also that would be agreeing with my diary. It, it helps so much because then we force dates on people. At times you're unwell. At times the child is not ready to testify. You have a date, you must come to court. I just want that child to tell me, uh, I'm unwell this morning. Can I, can I come to court on this date? Let them communicate with me directly. Right. Let them get access to my e-diary so that they can pick a date and a time that is specific to them. And also, uh, we need laws on Oxair, for instance. Share renting. Kenya is known for share renting. We mm -hmm. raise our children with the online community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know why we must post your child swimming in Mombasa. You have exposed that child already. Those pictures, I'm told our children are being auctioned in porn sites, and you just need to pick a child you've shared online, whether it's on WhatsApp, you know, or sub story. We just pick that child's uh, image, we do AI on it, and we go and auction your child in a site. And they're, 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 I'm told the African child is, goes to the highest bidder, and it's a lot of money. So parents, we really don't want to know why we don't want to know why, where. We, we don't want to know those things. Don't tell us you've given birth. Kindly keep that to yourself. You, you, you can maybe, <laughs> don't tell us. I mean, we've been waiting for you to give birth to come and steal that child. So we even know the hospital, Aga Khan, here I come. Labor, you know, you're always, I mean, baby is here. You're, I mean, who needs to know those things? Protect these children. I'm looking forward to the time children will sue their parents for posting their photos online because yeah. that is the beginning of all these problems. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we are dealing with identity issues. Mm -hmm. We are dealing with a fake um, lifestyle mm -hmm. where you want to portray this kind of life, but we know you still live in Gidurai, yes. <laughs> I, am not, I, I have no problem with that, but don't post your children as you advertise your lifestyle. Stay the children out of it, mm -hmm. kindly. That is the only thing I'll say. Share renting should now be an offense, punishable by, I don't want to say death. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much, um, Honorable Kibosia, Joy, Nelson, Valentine, for a wonderful conversation. There's obviously so much to look forward to. Um, and like I said, these conversations, we cannot have a conclusive 
you know, conversation and say we've discussed children and digitized legal systems, and there's nothing more to say. So we definitely look forward to continuing these conversations. Hopefully, have you come back on the Wakilisha podcast and talk about all the different things um, we've talked about today. So thank you very much, and thank you everyone for listening. Everyone listening online, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed that conversation and learned a lot from our great panelists. Um, we were having a conversation um, amongst the three of us talking about how, you know, you just, as a parent, you can innocently post a photo of your child and go ahead with your day. And then, you know, you later realize that, you know, you can see that, you can see how many people save a post on Instagram or um, TikTok. Yeah, it's crazy to see how many people save that and you wonder who like who are all these people saving this picture of you know a child that was very innocently posted by their parents right so yeah i mean in light of that whole conversation i hope yeah we can just be very careful also with what we put out out there um yeah especially with with children right mm, yeah yeah but yeah we hope you did enjoy that conversation and um to wrap it up so that you know you don't leave the episode feeling very you know, sad or down, we, we, we do have a light game, you know, just to lighten things up like we always do on this uh, podcast. We're going to start with Liz. Mm -hmm. And I don't uh, know if we have the timer ready. Yes. Okay. Can go? Yes. Okay. Friends or family? Ha, I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Dark. Singing or dancing? Hmm. Hmm. Dancing. Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. Pants or shorts? Pants. Dress or skirt? Dress. Mop or vacuum? Mop. Asia or Europe? Europe. Suitcase or backpack? Suitcase. Too much sleep or little sleep? Too much sleep. <laughs> Drama or fantasy? Fantasy. Hot or cold? Hot. House or apartment? House. Unicorn or dragon? What? Uh, unicorn? Happy or sad? <laughs> Happy. <laughs> Boiled egg or fried egg? Fried egg. Ice cream or cake? Ice cream. Uh, I don't know. Um, cake. <laughs> movie date or dinner date? Uh, movie date. Flats or heels? Flats. Any Tails day or day. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, uh, yeah. Right. Now we can have... Zippy go again. And All right. Is the timer ready? Yes. Okay. So, basketball or football? Uh, oh, football. To give or to receive? Uh, to give. Burgers or hot dogs? Uh, burgers. Samsung or iPhone? iPhone. Sausage or bacon? A sausage. Train or plane? A train. Coffee or tea? Tea all the way. <laughs> Old or new? Uh, depends on what, but new. <laughs> <laughs> Iced coffee or hot coffee? Uh, hot coffee. <laughs> run or bike? I don't know even how to ride a bike. So oh run. my goodness! <laughs> Wings or ribs? Uh, ribs. Uh, cheesy or chili? Cheesy. Book or movie? Movie. Pop or reggae? Reggae. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Casual or formal? Casual. With makeup or without makeup? Without makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Time is up. Okay, there we go. Well, yeah, we hope you enjoy learning a few things about us as much as you do enjoy um, listening to the podcast. Um, we, do, we have come to the end of this um, second part of the series. Um, of course, if you would like to keep up with Wakilisha more, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. It's wakili.sha or wakili underscore sha on Twitter. Um, you can view the disc all the links will be in the description below. Um, but we'd like to give a super huge thanks to our sponsors who made this possible and our panelists who joined this panel and everyone who's been supporting Wakilisha and our journey so far. And um, we look forward to seeing you soon. Rate, review, subscribe, share.